The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. David Onley was a journalist, an advocate, a father, and one of the finest public servants ever to sit as the Queen's representative in Ontario. Tonight, his life and legacy of fearless determination in all things. First up, J.N. Jagannathan tracks the rise in violence on Toronto Transit and asks whether a bigger police presence will really help. It's Thursday, February 2nd, and that's next on The Agenda. An uptick in violent and often random attacks on Toronto's transit system put the TTC and the city on alert that more needs to be done to ensure public safety. With us now for their insight on the causes and possible solutions, John Danino, President of the Amalgamated Transit Union Canada, Diana Chan McNally, Harm Reduction Case Manager at All Saints Toronto, a downtown mission, and Lex Harvey, Transportation Reporter for the Toronto Star. Welcome all of you to our studios. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so Lex, I'm going to start with you. You've crunched some numbers, of course, as a Transportation Reporter for the Toronto Star. Um, it feels like we've seen story after story of an assault or an attack. Is violence actually going up? Is it on the rise on public transit? Yeah, so in the past couple of weeks, obviously, we've seen a very alarming series of violent attacks on transit, but this is all occurring within the broader context of violent crime increasing on Toronto's subway system. So if we look back at 2019, the TTC tracks the number of violent offences against customers every year. So those are the mo most serious offences where police tend to get involved. So in 2019, we had about 666 of those. Okay. And then we only have data up until November from last year, but it was 923 okay. last year. And we have to consider that it's only about two thirds of the riders at most. So we ended the year with about 68% of weekday riders compared to before the pandemic. So more violent incidents, fewer riders. Okay. Um, something that also people are looking at and, and, and sort of something you've looked at is, is this happening in cities outside of Canada, particularly to our neighbors to the south? Yeah, so it is a trend that we're seeing across Canada as well as in American cities. Um, New York has seen a worrying increase on its subway system. Last year they had more than 10 murders, which was, a, I think, a 20-year high. Hmm. Um, I would have to fact check that, but definitely, you know, very, very concerning there. Philadelphia, Chicago. Um, so this is something that, that we're seeing kind of across the board in North America, not just in Toronto. John, I'm going to come to you. You are uh, the president of ATU Canada. You represent workers all across this province. What about other cities in Ontario and in Canada? So we're seeing the uptick right across the country broadly. Uh, you know, we're seeing anywhere between a 7 and 10 percent increase. And those are only the numbers that are coming forward to us today. Uh, agencies have not been uh, reporting accurately and efficiently as we would like them to. And so we're still waiting for the year and results for 2022. But I will say that this uptick in violence is not just in Canada. We are an international union and we're seeing the same kind of uptick in the United States south of the border. In fact, as I sit here today, we had our second murder of a transit operator yesterday in the DC area. So we've had two ATU members die from uh, shootings in the last three days. You, you had mentioned uh, sort of how much gets reported. Um, I'm curious, what constitutes a reported incident of violence? Because there is some pretty strict and stringent sort of rules. So the best we're seeing from the transit agencies is they categorize uh, the violence against our staff, our operators, on a level one, level two, and level three. And, you know, most times they're only reporting those injuries that are an aggravated assault or those that involve weapons. Um, the simple... The simple assaults like being threatened or being spat on or punched or pushed are being underreported. And, and even our frontline staff aren't reporting all of those incidences. And that's why we say that there are thousands of, of assaults being reported annually and there's thousands more that are unreported. With that being said, are people just reporting these incidences more in, in sort of this time lapse that we're seeing right now? Are people just reporting more incidences or are people experiencing more attacks? Uh, people are experiencing more attacks and more violent attacks. You know, um, as I said, you know, previously it was being spat on, punched, pushed, threatened. 
Uh, but now we're seeing the uptick in the violence is becoming more and more severe. And what we're not seeing uh, and when we're not gauging, and when I say we, the transit agencies, is not just the physical harm that's being imposed on our people, but the emotional and, and trauma and the long-term effects of PTSD that are affecting our people from being able to return to work and being able to return to work safely. All right, Diana, I'm gonna come to you. Um, you work in a pretty central part of this city. Uh, you are a transit rider yourself. Mm -hmm. um, do you think people feel unsafe on transit? Well, if I'm speaking about my community and I'm, we're talking about people who are actively unhoused, yes, they feel unsafe on transit because they feel like they're being targeted. Um, I think we have two very separate but very visible um, phenomena that are actually happening on the TTC right now. One would be violence and the other would be people who are unsheltered, uh, who are actually taking shelter on the TTC. Um, I think it's unfortunate that we are conflating these two uh, and we're seeing that there is some targeting. We've seen videos of police specifically targeting people who are unhoused on the TTC uh, and we see them uh, going in and out of transit, not being able to actually rest for a moment but they also have nowhere else to go mm -hmm. um, so for my folks yes they feel unsafe but probably for different reasons than other people may cite uh, as feeling unsafe and where's it when you say there's nowhere else to go we're talking about our shelters mm -hmm. pretty much bursting at the seams yeah. this is a place where a lot of people might be taking it just to stay out of the cold and, and just ride loops of, of transit uh, of routes over and over again. Yeah, absolutely. Um, before the pandemic, we actually had drop in space that was open 24 seven. Uh, so people had somewhere that they could go, even if it wasn't actively a shelter bed, there was some place that they could be that was safe uh, and that would actually have supports on site. That has been eliminated. And what we've seen is that people take up de facto shelter in other locations, and that includes hospital ERs, that includes libraries, uh, that includes coffee shops like Tim Hortons, and then it also includes the TTC. Um, so we are forcing people into these spaces because we are actually not fulfilling uh, their right to adequate shelter. All right, so in light of all of this, we reached out to the TTC chair, Councillor John Burnside of Ward 16, Don Valley East, about what's being done about the attacks on transit. Here's part of what he sent in a statement. In the short term, we are turning to Toronto Police Services, security teams, and additional special constables to keep us safe. We have streets to homes workers on our system now and are adding more. While we're doing everything we can to keep our riders and employees safe, the TTC can't fix the underlying causes of homelessness, mental illness, and addiction. That's why Mayor Tory and I have committed to investing in all aspects of community safety. Diana, there are some parts that I want to pick up on there, some language there, some, some words of mention of mental illness, those experiencing homelessness and addiction. What are your thoughts on just that statement alone? And, and again, it does it seem like there's some conflation here with those two? Absolutely. I think there's a lot of stigma that is attached to being unhoused, uh, where we make an assumption that someone who is unhoused is constantly um, in crisis, someone who's exp experiencing mental illness. And you're in crisis insofar as you don't have any kind of shelter. Um, so to a certain extent, you are in survival mode. Uh, but I think we are absolutely conflating that safety issues are because uh, we have people who are unsheltered on the CTC. And I think that's incredibly unfair. I think that's stigmatizing. And I don't think that's actually addressing the issue. If we look at who is committing these attacks, it is not tied to any one demographic, uh, but we are actively targeting this group, uh, which I would call a form of bigotry. Lex, I'm going to come to you. I think I know the answer to this, but when speaking with the experts that you speak to when you're covering transit beat, what do we know about the correlation of mental health and violence? Is there one? Yeah, I mean, I think I agree with a lot of what Diana just said. I think we can't be pinning violence on one singular factor like that. Uh, the data just really doesn't support it, and I think it can be very detrimental when we scapegoat a certain group of people in that way. Um, you know, what I've heard from speaking to public health experts, uh, other advocates like Diana, is that what we need to consider here is the combination of factors right now. Um, a lot of people are really struggling. Uh, they have been for a long time, but many things that were exacerbated during the pandemic, such as our affordable housing crisis, our shelter system is really overburdened. People are struggling to afford basic necessities. Um, and then in terms of mental health care, like only people who can afford it really receive that kind of support. And so while we need to be careful to link one of these particular things to violence, I think it's more what we're seeing is a confluence of factors all happening at the same time. And, you know, someone might be in a situation where they don't have a safe place to call home. And at the same time, they're not getting support and they don't have basic goods. And those kinds of situations really, I think, increase the propensity for someone to be in crisis. John, I saw you nodding your head. I want to get your take on that as well. Yeah, I, I would agree. You know, it's not just about the mental health. 
there's so many different components here that, that we need to address. And, uh, you know, when, when we asked for the task force, and I'm sure we're going to speak about it today, but when we asked about the task force, we said that policing wasn't the only solution. We refer to mental health issues. But my own experience just recently, I was in, I was in a subway station and someone was in crisis. And, met, and the police responded to that incident. And all they did was take that individual, put them on a train and move them along the system. That individual in crisis did not get the help they need. But I want to be clear, when we ask for some of these things, people, you know, people who are suffering from mental health issues are not the only offenders. And I don't want to categorize that it's strictly about the mental health like the speakers before me. So I think that's important from the ATU perspective that we're not just categorizing those with mental health as the people or the culprits in these acts of violence. All right, let's uh, pull up some stats on how the city is responding. The city of Toronto released this just the other day, saying it would provide the TTC with 20 community safety ambassadors, an additional 50 security guards, and more de-escalation training for TTC staff. This is on top of the 80 Toronto police officers and more uniformed TTC employees and more. John, is this enough? Well, it's not enough. And so, you know, unless you have the resources and the funding models to support those kinds of initiatives, there are going to be shortfalls in how these things roll out. And the, vi the viability of public transit is at risk right now because we haven't regained pre-pandemic levels. But it needs to go beyond that. You can't just give somebody a crash course for four hours on de-escalation and think you've done your job. This needs to be an ongoing process with refresher trainings, and an ongoing commitment, not just a reactive measure in crisis mode. And that's what we're asking for. And that, again, that's why in the task force, we left it open vaguely because we need to come together, figure out what the root cause problems of these assaults are and this violence, and how we tackle these things on the broader spectrum. Lex, when speaking with transit riders, uh, you've done a, a number of sort of conversations, exposés on, on the start of that. Um, do they want to see more security and, and police? I think it's hard to, to have one response. I mean, we have more than one million people mm -hmm. who take the TTC every day. So there are many different people who feel different ways. Um, I think there are certainly people who, who feel like they would feel more safe with more police on the system. But at the same time, we know that Toronto Police's own data shows that racialized Torontonians are more likely to have worse outcomes with police. So, you know, for example, black and indigenous riders in particular maybe are not feeling as safe with police or they may feel less safe having police there. I think most riders I've spoken to say that there, there needs to be more of a coordinated approach here, considering some of the root causes that might be driving this violence, rather than just policing away a problem that can't be policed away. All right, Dan, I'm going to come to you. We're going to pick up on a couple of thoughts uh, that Lex had mentioned. But uh, over the weekend, there were still more reports of attacks, despite this announcement last week that, you know, we are going to bring in more police. Do we know if more security and more police will keep workers and passengers safe? That is not evidence-based at all. Um, and I think, you know, at the heart of it, what we're suggesting, uh, because the narrative is very much about people experiencing crisis, and I appreciate that others are pointing out that that is not exclusively the case, uh, but we're saying that if people are in mental health crisis, the answer is to police them. That is suggesting that if you are in crisis, you are a criminal. I think that's an extremely problematic response. And even if we have people like myself, a crisis worker, uh, who are going into these spaces, where are we going to take people? If they're unhoused, they have nowhere to go. If they are experiencing crisis, we don't have enough community-based mental health supports to actually provide people uh, with the kind of support that they need. So I don't see that this is effective uh, in any stretch of the imagination. Uh, and in fact, again, I think it makes people feel very unsafe in a lot of cases, uh, especially if they're marginalized, and particularly for my folks who are unhoused, who are over-policed, they don't feel safe. All right, uh, I'm going to go read uh, another Toronto Star article. Uh, this is uh, from the perspective of Matt Elliott, uh, who wrote an opinion piece earlier this week in the Toronto Star. Rewind a decade ago, and riding the system used to be more routine interactions with TTC workers. You'd board streetcars by the front door and pay at a fare box next to the operator. Entering a station generally meant going past a booth with a real-life person selling tokens. There were at least two employees on every subway train, a driver and, of course, a guard, who would be responsible for making sure platforms were clear and doors were safely closed. These days, all of that has changed. John, it feels like there are less workers on the system. Is this a factor when we're talking about safety and security? Absolutely a factor. As we sit here today, the TTC is positioning itself to remove the guard's position on subway trains. 
We're going f from a two-person operation to a one-person operation. I think it's unconscionable to think that the safety of our riders is paramount when you're removing 50% of your resources from that vehicle. It's a 500-foot train that's moving in rush hour with 2,000 people on board, and we're cutting back. How is the operator of that train supposed to safely maneuver that train through tunnels, through stations, but see 500 feet behind them and share the safety of their passengers? Um, you know, we're seeing the cuts, we're seeing technology take over. You cannot take the human element out of the service we provide and the frontline service and the visibility. And so I think that the TTC needs to rethink their position when it comes to cutting jobs. I think they need more visibility and more customer service. Lex. Ridership is down. Uh, there are less workers, it seems. Um, service is a bit spotty uh, than what it used to be. And, um, you know, people are afraid to go on. They're probably opting for uh, ride sharing like Uber. Um, what impact will this have on the city in transit? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that article that you mentioned by Matt. I think he hit the nail on the head in terms of what riders have been telling me as well, which is that they feel more safe when there are more people on the system. And so I think increasing ridership is actually a really big part of the solution here. Um, and then in terms of what what's gonna happen from here, well, as you mentioned, we're, we're seeing with this proposed budget, if it gets approved in a couple weeks, that service is going to be cut even further, fares are going to go up. And so I think, you know, transportation experts have been telling me that the consequence of that, you know, might be even fewer riders. And so that could increase this dilemma for us. And of course, if people are, are feeling unsafe, that's kind of further adding to the problem. Um, I mean, I think it's really important to be clear here that while these attacks that have happened have, have been frequent, they are rising and they are unacceptable. As a whole, our transit system does remain safe for the vast majority of people. But safety is one thing. Perception of safety is another thing that's mm -hmm. important and powerful here. And even if the, con the odds of someone actually getting targeted on their subway trip are really low. If that person's just not feeling safe, they're gonna opt for other modes of transportation and that'll lead to us having fewer people on the system and ultimately less revenue and sending our, our system into a place where we don't want it to go. I don't know if it's just me, but I feel like with the, the on that on that note of perception, the number of people that I've had reach out to me being, are you on the subway? Are you on the train today? Are you okay? Take some extra cautions. It's, the, perception is a very, very strong tool. Um, Diana, I want to come to you. Uh, you know, we've heard in the reporting that there are some solutions and we, we're hoping to get some solutions from you. Um, can you give us a couple of examples of what potentially some solutions could be to addressing safety on the transit? Well, as I said, I mean, it's certainly not police. Um, again, I'm, I'm speaking uh, in Do they have any role in safety at all on transit? They don't address uh, crime in a preventative fashion. They can address it perhaps after it happens, but what value uh, is that ultimately in this kind of space? I think it's pretty limited. Um, someone like me, a crisis worker, again, we come in when someone has gotten to the point of going into crisis, which is to say that we didn't provide them with enough support or resources prior to that, and they've gotten to this point. Um, so people like me, even if we are investing in crisis workers on the TTC, what are we doing to address the fact that people are still going to continue going into crisis? We go in for a little while, we help, but then what? Um, so, you know, I believe fully uh, in investing in upstream solutions. Uh, and I know that's a little bit of a nerdy phrase, but this is to say what things- is, What does upstream solution mean? Things that actually address the root causes okay. of why people are experiencing crisis. And we can talk about things like um, income inequality. We can talk about housing not being available, not having enough mental health supports for people. We're coming out of a pandemic. Everybody's still stressed out and that's completely valid and I don't think we're actually actively supporting that. Um, so we should not be investing in these after the fact emergency kinds of supports. We need to give people what they need to be well so that they don't enter into a state of crisis. All right, John, uh, you've appealed to all levels of government uh, for a national transit task where you had mentioned earlier. Um, what would a real solution look like coming from a task force like that? So obviously we need to engage all levels of government, municipalities and transit agencies. This is not just about the City of Toronto for the ATU. This is about Canada as a whole. We're seeing th this problem right across the nation. We need to come up with concrete plans on how we can mitigate some of these risks, understanding that we're not going to eliminate them all. Um, far too often we see the agencies uh, imposing reactive measures. I think a more strategic plan on how we enhance safety 
not only for our frontline staff, but for the riders, needs to be uniform across this country from agency to agency. Uh, you know, we talk about de escalation training, mental health awareness training. Uh, we talk about criminal code reforms, in particular, um, the criminal code 26901, which is uh, about um, assaults against our operators. Uh, and so, you know, police, increased police visibility is great. It brings a sense of comfort to the riders, but it doesn't address the fundamental problems. You know, I look at the TTC here today, and if, we're, if, we, are, if we are really um, want to address these issues, I, I can't understand in today's technology why we don't have cell service in subway stations so that when somebody's in crisis or when there's an incident happening, that our commuters can access all of the services that are needed in real time, other waiting for a customer service representative to address it or pulling a fire alarm or cutting power. There needs to be a way in today's world where our riders can feel safe by being able to dial 911 when the situation is happening in real time. All right, we have a couple of seconds left, John. I'm going to ask you, you know, ridership is down. That's a big source of, of revenue for the TTC. Uh, how will public transit get what it needs uh, for it to be safe for not only its passengers but its workers? Well, I think, I think again, this is where all levels of government need to come into play. I think we need dedicated operational funding and we need support from all levels of government to invest in public transit from a social housing perspective, from a mental health perspective, from a climate change perspective. Uh, and we need to bring more people into the transit systems, not less. And I know Lex said something the other day that caught my, my mind, and that is a, a reducing service and increasing fares is a downward spiral of, of what is going to look like an inadequate transit system right across this country. Mm -hmm. All right, we're gonna have to leave it there. John, Lex, Diana, thank you so much for thank a really you. great conversation. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks so much. Earlier this week, for the first time in more than a decade, Ontario buried one of its former lieutenant governors. David Onley did not fit the mold of a typical vice regal representative. He'd never been elected, never been a big political donor or fundraiser, never been a close friend to prime ministers. And yet, former Prime Minister Stephen Harper gave him the job in 2007, and Onley truly made it his. In spite of, or maybe because of, the polio that afflicted him as a child. Only connected with the public and through his seven years on the job became a true champion for those with disabilities. Joining us now, four guests who knew him well. The youngest of his three sons, Michael Onley. Former Deputy Premier Christine Elliott, co-founder of the Abilities Center in Whitby. Thea Curdy, President, Designable Environments, Inc. And she is signing her name right now. And Lauren McDonald, human rights lawyer and accessibility advocate. She was born with profound hearing loss. She was recently inducted into the Canadian Disability Hall of Fame. We are very happy to have you four here tonight for this very important conversation. And uh, I'm going to start by saying something that I know you know, but I want you to hear anyway. You and your siblings, your two brothers, were magnificent at the funeral that took place on Monday. Your eulogies were just Fantastic, just spot on. And I am, uh, I'm interested to know what you and your family think about the really amazing outpouring of love and support for your dad that has happened since his death two weeks ago. Well, first off, thank you. It's, it's a real honor to be here. Um, overwhelming, that's the first word I believe that our family has really felt. Overwhelming in such a positive way and also humbling because for me i just knew my dad as just that dad but he as we have seen over the last two weeks he meant so much to so many people in so many different ways and so i always said growing up that dad's my hero and as i see and realize more clearly in many ways he was a hero to a lot of Canadians. And to see that and to know that and to understand that, uh, it's something that I'll take with me forever. This is a, uh, no doubt going to be a hard question to answer, but, but what was the one moment in the funeral, above all others, that stood out for you? I would say the bagpipes. The bagpipes playing, it signified in many ways uh, the end, in some ways. Uh, but in other ways, it 
it really strengthened me uh, because I realized there's so much that has to be done up ahead. And uh, in that split second, my spirit, my heart just felt pain. But then, you know, my spirit, heart then felt strength that we as Canadians have so much to do up ahead uh, to tackle this large and looming reality. And, and that is that there are so many Canadians right now who are struggling, who are hurting, and they need to know that they're not alone. And um, it is just something that I take great honor moving forward to, to champion. Whose tie is that? That is dad's tie. And uh, it was the only tie that I thought was suitable for today to wear, to honor him and uh, to remember him as well. Great choice. Thank you. Well, we have uh, three others here who knew him well, and we'd like to get some feedback from all of you on what you think. We're going to have this conversation about what we still need to do. Because Michael called me a week ago and challenged us to have this conversation on TVO, so we're going to do that. Uh, but before, we need to get a better sense, and Christine, why don't you start us off here. David Onley's legacy to the province of Ontario, what is it? It's a, it's a great legacy. He's a wonderful, kind man, but he really was a true champion for people with disabilities, and he uh, didn't um, hold back from saying so. And he listened to everyone. He always had time for everyone. And uh, he learned from that, and he went and spoke publicly about it. I think that is a true leader, and that's what I will always remember him for. Lauren, how about you? His legacy in your view. Well, I think the most important thing that I realized is that I so value my relationship with David that it became stronger during COVID. Because, of course, we weren't able to gather and, and meet like we normally would. And upon his passing and then in talking with friends within the disability community at the, the, uh, the church on Monday, I realized that the, the deep relationship I felt, the mentorship, the sponsorship, the encouragement that I received from David, I wasn't alone. Mm -hmm. That he made every single person feel just as special, just as empowered, just as um, feeling strong that they can do more as well. Where he found the time, I'll never know, but he was so generous with the time, it would be a text here, an email there, um, just to encourage us to join him in making an accessible country. Yeah. See ya. You know, I think um, I got to know David through Twitter. Uh, I was noticing one of the problems um, with the legislation was that um, we had just recently passed the employment accessibility standard, which talked about make changing hiring practices, but we didn't hadn't change anything for the built environment. So I tagged him in a tweet saying, what did they have to do to Queen's Park for him to become Lieutenant Governor? And um, he replied. <laughs> and at the time, he was the uh, uh, accessibility special advisor to the government and invited me in. So this was after he was LG? Uh, after he was LG, mm -hmm. um, and we both lamented that. We, if only we had met sooner uh, or started talking sooner. Um, but, you know, he said it was so, so exciting to talk to me, as, as exciting as it was for me to talk to him, because I had a lot of the missing pieces of the puzzle about what was going wrong in the built environment. And I think what I loved best about him was his ability to be likable, even though he could be incredibly pointed in criticism. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought he was so great at that. Well, one moment where he was really there for you, hmm. you and Michael's mother have something in common. You both lost your husbands at too young an age. Yes. And when you lost your husband, what did David Onley do? Uh, he and Ruth Ann were incredibly supportive. They were reaching out to me. They uh, sent us possibly the biggest points that I've ever seen. It was a bush, uh, just to make sure that we didn't feel alone. Um, and you know what? Through you know, in the last few years, I've sort of changed my position in the company and started coming out more publicly to sort of share what I know, what I was sharing with him, but share more publicly. And he was so supportive of whenever I would feel nervous about that or any time I would feel uh, scared. So this was just a continuation of him being there and actually 
today I'm going to miss him a lot right after because every time I would do an interview, he would call me afterwards and tell me, you know, you did a great job and console me about the things I would be upset that I hadn't said. <laughs> and he, was, he always reminded me he never stopped feeling that way himself. Hmm. Michael, you had a line in your eulogy in which you said, my dad and I didn't go for jogs. Nope. Didn't throw a baseball. Nope. Because he could barely lift his arms given the polio that yes. had afflicted him. What could he do for you? You said this as well. Well, he was present. And because he was present, you couldn't help but feel his love. It's, um, we live in a day and age where we are all so distracted. There's so many things that can pull our attention away from what truly matters. And, that, and, and that's something we, we all say, oh, something that matters. Well, what does matter? You, you realize it's the presence of someone. And as I've experienced, even in the last two and a half weeks, my dad's presence no longer being with me, um, I, I do feel him, you know, I sense his love. That was the greatest thing that he instilled in me, that I was loved and that I was cared for and that I mattered. And those are traits that I'll carry with me for the rest of my life. That became a big deal in particular. You told this story in the eulogy. When you suffered a severe concussion. Yes. And. Um, well, you, you kind of, uh, you, you threw out a little scoop there. You said he almost quit being lieutenant governor so that he could stay home and take care of you. Yes. How close did he come to doing that? Very close. Uh, it was November 30th, 2007, and by February 2008, I didn't know this, but he had had conversations with my mother and conversations with the lieutenant governor's team of how do I properly put together a roadmap exit strategy so that I can take care of my son? And that was years after he was Lieutenant Governor. This had to have been 2016, 2017, where we had a candid conversation. Because at that point, I was still suffering. I, I, my, my recovery from my concussion lasted a decade. So it was a, a pretty raw conversation to have with your father, not knowing that. But that's exactly, you know, you asked earlier, what, what could he do? What, what did he do? Well, that's what he did. Uh, that's what he did was being so uh, present with the situation that Lieutenant Governor's role was so important to him. It was something that he, I know he was so um, honored and humbled to have, but that was completely trumped by being dad. And because of that, it's something that I, I'll carry with me when, for my future children, uh, for my wife and I, Stephanie, that that's the greatest gift a father can, can give to their children, just being present. Amen. Christine Elliott, in all the time you spent with him, did you ever hear him complain about his physical limitations? Never once. No, no. He was, in fact, he was always very kind and, and asking after me. At one point, I, I broke my ankle skiing. Clearly, I'm not a very good skier. Um, but I was on crutches, and uh, uh, David asked if I wanted to borrow one of his extra scooters to get around Queen's Park. <laughs> uh, but that's the kind of person he was, always thinking of other people, not thinking about himself, just getting on with it. And I think that was why people loved him so much. Did you ever uh, have conversations with him about his physical limitations because of the polio? No, we never talked about that, but we did talk about um, how to make uh, places and uh, people uh, in their own minds more accessible to allow everyone to be able to live up to their full potential. And David believed very strongly in that, and he showed that in his own life. Mm. Did you ever hear him complain about his circumstances? Uh, no, because we both had disabilities of different kinds. And so we were more united in figuring out how can we use our experiences, our lived experience, to educate people. And it's just, uh, it just wasn't in its nature to complain. And in fact, uh, I do a lot of webinars and, and instructions about um, what to do to become more accessible and such. So I did a webinar just a few days after David had passed, and the question invariably comes up, what do we do with heritage buildings or historical buildings? How can we improve that when we're not able to? And so I started with, you know, we have to balance accessibility with heritage, and, uh, and then a small voice inside uh, stirred me and said, tell them about my experience. And it was David. 
Hmm. And immediately, never used this example before, but I said, in fact, David Audley, when he was appointed lieutenant governor, the vice regal suite was not accessible. <laughs> this is in a heritage building, uh, the legislative building of Ontario, and it was made accessible. An elevator was put in, ramp were put in. What was the line they used at the funeral? If, uh, if they want if they me? If they want me, they're going to have to prove it. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> if they want me, they're going to have to prove it. And, and that was after, but that was a very powerful um, example that other accessibility advocates are saying, I knew that story, but I've never used it. Now I will. Well, before he was lieutenant governor, he was, of course, a journalist. Yes. That's when I first met him, in the early 1980s. Yes. We were both street reporters at the same time. <clears throat> and here he is on City TV debriefing Gord Martineau about an upcoming election. This is almost 30 years ago. Sheldon, if you would. There's a catch-22 here, too, isn't there, yes. David? Uh, the, among uh, uh, disabled people, the employment rate is something like 50 percent, but they yeah. can't go out and look for jobs because they're afraid of losing their benefits. That's it, exactly. And so you have like a, almost a built-in underclass of people who don't want to go and look, but they do want to go and look. They're just mm -hmm. afraid of losing the benefits. So obviously, uh, all of the parties have to address this. Somebody's going to be the premier in yeah. a, a week, and uh, the various groups are saying none of them have really gotten down to brass tacks with the issue. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you, David. Look at that, Michael. What do you think? We, I mean, that's a guy telling it like it is, hey? What do you think when you <laughs> see that? It's, it's remarkable to see how here we are, almost 30 years later, a lot has changed. Mm -hmm. But has it? Has it really changed? Mm -hmm. uh, not much has changed in many ways. He, he was very candid about Ontario being a, a, a quite accessible province. And he's right in many ways. Um, but as Thea and I spoke before the show, there is a mountain ahead for Canadians, and that is that all Canadians in some capacity will experience disability. Mm -hmm. It's not a matter of if, mm -hmm. but when. And it's rooted in three things, aging, injury, disease. And at some point, a Canadian will experience that. So in regards to my father, it, it's, it's amazing how timing, you can see how time moves forward, but sometimes, unfortunately, a lot of things simply don't. They don't change. Well, eight years ago on this program, we did something called the Two Davids. Your dad was one of them, and David Lepofsky, the great yeah. champion for uh, disabled rights, was the other one. And... Uh, your dad did not mince words on this program either. Sheldon, if you would. David Onley, you said the following. Mm -hmm. When I was Lieutenant Governor, I had to be apolitical. Well, now I don't have to be. So let me say, accessibility is a national shame. Mm -hmm. Why'd you say that? Because it's true, to begin with. Um, people with disabilities are the largest single minority group in our society, and we David and I, me because of my physical disability, David uh, being blind, um, we who are members of the disability community are the last group in our society to achieve full civil rights because today people with disabilities do not have full civil rights. Thea, did you notice him becoming increasingly impatient with the slow rate of progress after his vice regal term was over? Absolutely. Uh, we saw a shift in the way he was thinking and the way we would talk about. Um, he started with, well, if I could just make people aware of the facts. And he, he really bought into the idea initially of using moral suasion. And, you know, if I just made people aware of how much smarter it is and how much more sustainable it is, that people will, you know, of course, just come on board. Um, but after he did the AODA legislative review, uh, 2019, the report was released four years ago this week, um, and still nothing has happened. Uh, during that review process, his viewpoint changed. He really started to understand uh, and agree with Lepofsky that we have to strengthen the legislation and we have to enforce it. And it's that lack of um, consequence that has really, unfortunately, we've seen too many people starting to shrug it off. Okay, AODA is supposed to have made Ontario accessible by 2025. The government didn't take it seriously enough to enforce it or to improve it or to fill in the gaps. And 
people have started ignoring us. I want to ask Christine Elliott about that. Did I mean, you're the one person here who's been elected, been in a position yes. of authority. Did he darken your door on occasions uh, trying to lobby you to get stuff done? No, he didn't, uh, but I knew what was important to him, and when I was uh, within government, I certainly did whatever I could to try and push things forward, but the wheels of government move very slowly, as you know. But there is a huge amount of work that needs to be done. Nobody's denying that. I think we need uh, governments of, of all kind, builders of all kind, to build accessible buildings to start with. This isn't that's out to allow people to exercise their human rights, to be able to get into a building and to be able to do their job. That's one thing where we've really fallen far behind on. I, I know that Thea is an expert on that and could speak more broadly on that, but that's one thing we need to do. And we also need to make sure that uh, employers also think about everybody when they're hiring. And we can't do that at a PR, public relations level. It has to come from the top so that that will permeate the entire organization. We need workers in Ontario. People, there are many people with disabilities who can work and who want to work, mm -hmm. and they need to be given that opportunity. So there's there's still all of that work yet to be done. Let me do a quick follow-up with you. you. You have triplet sons, as uh, most I think many people know, yes. one of whom has got an intellectual disability. Do you, yes. do you think do you think David Onley saw you as a kindred spirit because you share that? You are both from the same community in that respect. Yes, yes, I do think so, because David stood up for everyone. He wanted every person to be able to reach their full potential, regardless of their challenges, uh, of their different abilities. I prefer to see it that way. And uh, he was a champion for everyone, so I did feel that uh, David was very much a kindred spirit in that. Lauren, do you wish he had been more aggressive as Lieutenant Governor in championing these issues? <sighs> I know David and I were of the same view uh, because many, many years ago I worked with David Lepofsky in um, creating a forum to make Ontario more accessible. The AODA came in, I was in law school at the time, so my view was I wanted to work with government. David's view was the opposite view, room for both of us, absolutely. <laughs> And, uh, and I know that David Onley also was hoping to affect change from inside. And so we often talked about how we could do that. Now, as a lieutenant governor, of course, he had limitations. He was a, a <clears throat> superior statesman, no question. But uh, he was becoming, after his term ended, I could see he was becoming more and more frustrated, and as was I, because it was a constant repeat motion of fighting for this barrier and then we have to fight again and another one would crop up and and my work on the health care standard development committee with the aoda the final report was delivered a year ago for um to be made into regulation we're still nowhere i want to ask michael about that did your father chafe at the limitations of the vice regal job because, frankly, he couldn't say what he wanted to say a lot of the time because the job really doesn't allow for it. Yes, that, that was a very real and difficult reality for him during his seven years as lieutenant governor. Mm -hmm. But that's, it also speaks volumes to just who my dad was at the core of who he was because at the core of who he was was a man of, of great dignity, respect, and class to his fellow man and woman. Mm -hmm. um, he loved his neighbor as himself, and because he did, uh, that creates patience. <laughs> even when you want, even when there was great impatience within the progress that you had mentioned earlier, that wasn't really happening, uh, which speaks volumes to all of us moving forward. Uh, okay, um, we are supposed to be, let's sort of do a little pivot here and talk really about where we're at as a province right now, because the, the Ontario legislature unanimously passed the Disabilities Act once upon a time, saying that by the year 2025, okay. this province is basically supposed to be barrier free. Yeah. Uh, okay, how close are we to the promised land right now? Oh, n not. <laughs> we're, we're nowhere close. It's no. a very sad story, actually. Yeah. And one that uh, David Onley talked about when he was testifying at the Senate of Canada about the Accessible Canada Act was the lessons he had learned painfully, um, you know, 
he hadn't understood the magnitude of the systemic ableism we have in society, um, that there are gatekeepers and people who mistakenly have the impression, as Michael was saying, that this is happening to just a small a minority of minors and they want us to spend all this money on this ridiculous thing. Um, and so he really wanted to try to emphasize that change has to happen through legislation. He, that was a big change for him. Um, he taught a political science class at U of T and he spoke extensively about the problem and the barrier of ableism itself being one of the chief problems that we had. As long as people, like, think of how things would change in this studio, Steve. If you developed, and I don't, I'm not wishing bad things for you, but if you developed a physical disability and were, when I was learning universal design, my instructor was six foot two and had a ski accident and was using a wheelchair with a leg extension. Can and I that was something? great. Can I tell you something? Yeah. I normally don't talk about myself on this program, but the reality is uh, almost 20 years ago, I had back problems that put me in the hospital for a month. I couldn't walk. I didn't know if I'd ever walk again. So this is not an academic exercise what you're mm -hmm. talking about. I learned a lot at right. that time mm -hmm. about how inaccessible a lot of society was. Um, needed a walker to get around for a while after that as well. So, and I remember when your dad was in this studio for interviews numerous times and I would ask him, okay, how are we doing on this place being accessible for you mm -hmm. needing a scooter to get around? And uh, he said, not bad. Needs a little work, but not bad. Yeah. So we took all that to heart. Sorry to interrupt, but I just no, wanted no, to get that okay. on the No, no, that's okay. And you know, to the, the Christine's point is that if it's not in the legislation, people can't plan for it. So when you're hiring an accessibility consultant, because a lot of projects will say hire an accessibility consultant. Thank you. That's mm -hmm. great. But we're arriving way too late. Mm -hmm. The planning for where it's going to be, the budget, the space planning. If it's not in the legislation, people can't plan for it, and then they don't understand it's not in the building code yet. They they don't understand there is a few things for the built environment in the AODA, and it's important it's in the AODA because the building code is, doesn't allow to go past certain things. Or it's only allowed to do some things. Mm -hmm. And other things like furniture, it's not allowed to talk about. But if you don't plan a room with the furniture you need, then you're not going to have it. So it's important it's in right now, it's in the proposed education standard. We have built environment things that are not in the building code. I wish it had been in the um, healthcare standard because I worked on over 30 hospitals and none of them are fully accessible even mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. Can I go to you on this? How close do you you think we are to where we need to be? We're nowhere close, and and I'll say something somewhat controversial, but it's true, because I know you like that. We like truth here. <laughs> we do. Yes. I'll be a truth teller. Um, complete deference to my my colleague to the left, but uh, Premier Ford needs to stop gaslighting people with disabilities. What does that mean? Gaslighting is that. He made a statement on June 27th of 2022 saying that we'll make sure that we meet those timelines of a barrier-free province in 20, by January 1st of 2025. The community is all like, what's he talking about? This, this is not going to happen in any way, shape, or form. Because we're not close. Nowhere close at all. I believe that Michael, or the, I'm not sure, uh, said that since the review that David had done in 2019, the majority, if, if not all, wow. of the recommendations have not been accepted. We're now having a second review, but the Premier, by making a statement like that, saying, we're going to get there, folks. We're going to make that January 1st, 2025 deadline, and we're looking at each other. Where's he coming from? Hmm. And I've even had a senior Ontario um, staff member say to me, I said, well, say actually say, well, the legislation, the AODA doesn't actually say that, that we are to be barrier free by 2025. And I was like, what? Does it? <laughs> no, it does. It does, <laughs> it does. yeah. Can you give us some, because um, uh, obviously when this was passed to present day, we've seen two different parties in power. You know, we understand government moves, moves slowly, but what do you think holds this back from being realized? You know government from the inside. Help us understand it. I think it has to be made a priority because there's so many things in government that you need to deal with. Frankly, for the last three years, it's been COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, that took up all of my time when I was Minister of Health. But, but uh, now is the time to get back to it. I don't know how long it's going to take. I, I, 
fear it will not happen by 2025. Uh, but it is important. It is important to uh, to uh, the, so many people in Ontario, but it has to become a government priority. So I think you really need to get a minister to take that on as his or her cause. Mm -hmm. And because it affects every, every government mm -hmm. ministry, but it has yeah. to be someone that will take that on and make sure that things happen. Do you think now that COVID is more under control, it's not over, but it's more under control, do you think it's possible the Ford government, and I don't know how much in touch with them you still are, but do you think it's possible they may actually get it together on this? I hope so. I'm, I'm not allowed to be in touch with them for a period of time because I, uh, I left less than a year ago. Um, but I know it is important to uh, many people in government, but there is a lot yet to be done. I will certainly acknowledge that. Mm -hmm. and, the, and if I could yeah, just add very sure. quickly, I'm not blaming the Ford government. This happened under the Liberal government. It's a nonpartisan issue, mm -hmm. but we are all frustrated within the community of the lack of movement. So I'm not saying the Conservatives aren't getting it together. The Liberal Party oh, I is you. also. I get you. So just to clarify. Can I, let me put this to you, Thea, because, um, you know, uh, David and I used to talk about, this is the first time I've called him by his first name mm -hmm. since he was, well, since 2007. I had never called him David when he was we LG. We all call him David. <laughs> yeah, I, no, I never did. But when we would talk about it, you know, he would say things like, you know, it's not all bad out there. There's now elevators on, on subway stations. There's now cut curbs so that people who need walkers or wheelchairs you know, can do this. We see more ramps and so on. So he'd say it's not all bad, but we need more progress. Where do we need more progress on specifically? I, don't tell me 25 <laughs> things. Tell no, me three was, things that oh, need work. OK. Um, elevators. Uh, we do not design elevators to be accessible. So an elevator itself makes a building accessible, but we only require one elevator. And if that elevator breaks down, as happened in Vaughan Station when they opened the new Vaughan Station, right. it broke and was broken for six months. That station is not accessible during that period. So any building that has an elevator needs to always have at least two because one's going to need maintenance. Okay, good. Um, sticking with elevators, because I thought you might ask me this question, <laughs> uh, the emergency call button on, on an elevator does not work for deaf people. Um, mm -hmm. If you push the button, it's only audio. Uh, and the person on the other side so often gets that push and nobody responds that they often, they're not supposed to, but they often cancel the call. So we are having to work on a project right now where we've had to try to customize a, and they couldn't even do voice to text for some strange reason with all the technology we have that seemed bizarre to us. Um, but a, a custom yes and no buttons that they could be asking people. Mm -hmm. uh, for people with environmental sensitivities, um, which a lot of people have trouble with perfumes. It's not just the you know policy of asking people mm -hmm. not to wear perfumes or not having stinky uh, soap or stuff. It's about having the ventilation in the photocopy room, you know, mm -hmm. and, and uh, trying to create and choosing materials that in the first place are not going to become problems like the carpet. Th and these all sound doable. They 100% are, and we've known for over 20 years. I mean, I started my career, the City of London, Ontario, did a groundbreaking document called the Facility Accessibility Design Standards, and the sad thing is people forgot how groundbreaking that was. It was consulting with people with disabilities, it was using universal design to make the environment better for everybody. So everybody likes their electric toothbrush, that was designed for somebody with a disability. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of design accommodations that we have for people with disabilities, actually help everybody. I want to give Michael the last word here, which is, if we truly want to honor, as a province, mm -hmm. your father's legacy, what do we need to do? We don't back down. Mm -hmm. um, my dad was a champion for the people. He brought hope to the hopeless simply by showing up. The overarching theme that we had from the outpouring of love and support, especially when he was lying in state at Queen's Park, was how can we help? How can we get involved? And it comes down to the most basics of basics. It's, am I going to choose to love? Am I, and, and am I going to choose to love and, and be there? And that sounds so simple. And yet, for so much of this, a lot of you know, politicians, it's looking the other way. It's not wanting to address this. And, Ms. Elliott said it best. We, we need someone to want this. Mm -hmm. And my sense 
is that all Canadians do want this because in the end, disability will not discriminate. It's coming for all of us. Mm -hmm. And so it's up to us. It is up to us to say either, yes, I will do this, or no, I won't. Mm -hmm. And I believe that Canadians, deep within their heart, our hearts collectively as a whole, we truly, there's a reason uh, the world looks at Canada as the most polite and kind <laughs> country. It's because, quite frankly, we are. There is a sincerity amongst all humans in Canada uh, that look at each other as my dad looked at it. My dad looked at his people as just that, as people. Let's give David Onley the last word. Sheldon, put this up if you would. David Onley once said, Nobody loses to make the province more accessible. Nobody. Right on. I want to thank Michael Onley and Thea Curdy for being here today on this side of the table, Christine Elliott and Lauren McDonald for being here on that side of the table, and rest in peace, David Charles Onley. Thank you, everybody. That is the agenda for Thursday, February 2nd, 2023. Tomorrow, Jan Jagannathan finds out what a new report concludes about the effect of COVID misinformation on the health of Canadians. And just a note before we go, last week we hosted a very special event as part of our new TVO Today Live series. It was a sit-down interview with the legendary American journalist Bob Woodward. That conversation about truth, Donald Trump, and the future of U.S. politics airs tonight right after this program here on TVO, or you can stream it anytime on our YouTube channel, the TVO Today app, or via our many social media platforms. It was, if I may say, an unforgettable evening, and I hope you'll have the chance to check it out. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and Jan, we'll see you here tomorrow.